were to ask you which one is real, Clark Kent or Superman, what would you say? Now I know some people are like, well, that's obvious, right? But it's interesting because people will say Clark Kent. They see him with a nine to five job at the Daily Planet. He is dressed uh, for success. He's focused on the job when he is in this mode, he has his glasses on. But then when you see Superman, you think this is a, a an extraordinary person. This is a person that's not human. This is a person that's supernatural or superhuman. And the reality is when you dig deeper and you figure out Superman's background, he is actually the real one. He was born in another planet. He has superhuman powers. He has all of these skills that he dominates. And even in that, he has weaknesses. Yet Clark Kent is the image, is the person that he has to come up with. He has to dress up in order to blend into society, in order to be part of the norm and meet the status quo as to what a person should look like, what a human being should look like. Well, I bring this to your attention because a lot of what we live out in life can truly be based out of a Clark Kent mode instead of Superman. Now, I'm not here to try to say that we are superheroes, that we are supermen, that we have all of these extraordinary powers within our own means. Obviously, if you are a follower of Jesus Christ, as I am, we do have uh, supernatural powers in Christ. We are gifted the Holy Spirit, which is our comforter. He guides us and he also empowers us to do the works that the Lord has already predestined for us to do. And so we do walk by faith. We don't walk by sight. We have a destiny in mind. We walk in the spirit, not in the flesh. We do stand out. We are not the people that uh, are to just walk around this world as if we're normal per se. Peter in his letter, he writes and says that we are not of this world. We are of God. We are uh, royal priesthood. We have all of these characteristics that are not normal, that are not human, but it is not because of things that we've done, that we've accomplished. It is all at the expense of Christ's death on the cross, resurrection, and ascension to God the Father. And truly right now, he is seated at the right hand of the Father, according to scripture, interceding for you and I. So whatever superhuman things that we are able to walk in have nothing to do with us, has everything to do with the person of Jesus Christ. Now, having said that, we all also have kryptonite. Now, what if I told you that a kryptonite that we can look at today that you probably have never even heard of is something called false belief. Well, I know for me, for many years, I was believing lies. Now, I was a follower of Jesus, or at least I was a Christian. I knew about God. I knew about Jesus. I had heard the gospel. In fact, I preached it. I was a pastor for many years. I fed the flock. I submitted to the process and to the calling of answering a yes to the resounding call of God to follow him. Yet in my brokenness and in my, I guess, discovery of life and trying to figure things out for my own self, I had to realize that I was believing things that were not true. Now, I didn't know it at the time. See, this is what happens. We all have a belief system. And in this belief system, it is dependent on things that we think about. And those things that we think about, we add emotion to it. And when we add emotion to it, that's when it becomes a real thing. 
and it has the potential or the power to influence our behavior. And our behavior, as you know, gets us in trouble. So it doesn't start with just believing something false. It actually starts with a thought process. And because of our own insecurities and because of our own unwillingness to look at ourselves truly in the mirror as who we really are, we come to find out that a lot of the things that we actually do in life, the things that we pursue, even the things that we say about ourselves, when we really dig deep, they're not even true. Now, you may be saying, well, how do we live a life based on false beliefs? I mean, don't we kind of stumble upon the reality that it's not true? Don't we realize somehow, some way that it's not true? Well, the, the thing is that it doesn't come across that easily. In order for us to be living our lives based on a false belief, it has to seem real and it has to seem true to a degree. Remember, a counterfeit is only a counterfeit because a real thing exists. And a lot of times counterfeits have so much appearance to the real thing that it really takes an expert to look at it in different angles and use specific fancy tools in order to determine that this thing is actually a counterfeit. Whereas to the normal average person can look at this thing and say, this looks pretty legit. But then the professional, the expert, the one that knows, the one that created the real thing perhaps, or had something to do with the creation of the real thing, looks at it and says, no, this is, this is a counterfeit. So what if I told you that when God the Creator, God the Father, through His Son Jesus Christ, and the Holy Spirit look at our lives and begin to use those tools themselves, the Word, God's truth, God's absolute truth. What if I were to tell you that when God looks at our lives and starts to examine us because we ask God, Lord, help me in this process, He reveals to us the root cause of your behavior, of your thinking, is your belief system. Now, you may be saying, I, I, I'm not tracking with you, I, I, I don't get it. Well, here, here's, here's how it's broken down. I'll give you an example. See, I had the belief that in order for me to have worth, to have value, to be accepted, to be approved, to be affirmed in this world, I had the belief that I had to perform, that I had to do things, that I had to be great at things in order to find my value in people. Now, you, you, you may be saying, what? I mean, why would you believe that? Well, I wasn't believing it intentionally. This is the way I was living my life. I wasn't connecting the dots. I wasn't trying to say, well, let me make sure somebody likes me. Let me make sure I do the right thing. Let me make sure somebody pats me in the back. Let me make sure I have all these followers on social media. Let me make sure I got all the likes and the comments. And I wasn't seeking it in that way. But at the end of the day, because I lacked approval and affirmation from the right place, I was seeking it in all the wrong places. And then whatever was close to making me feel that I was accepted and that I, I had what it took and I had a, 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 a value in someone's eyes, I took it, I ran with it, and it made me feel better. Even at the cost of my marriage and of my family and ministry. So a false belief begins with something that you may even start doing with good intentions, yet at the end of it, when you truly look at it, the core reason or motivator behind it is a false belief. It is something that you have not even acknowledged to what it is. Something that you have not taken out the time to say, oh, that's the motivator. That's the root cause. I, I'm reminded of a story in the Bible to give you a little uh, more in-depth connection to what I'm trying to say. And it's the life of Gideon. You see, Gideon was 
working in, in a wine press and he had been hid in a way because he was afraid and frankly the whole Israelites, the whole nation of Israel was afraid of the enemies and so uh, he still needed to work, he still needed to provide for the family and so he, he did it in a, in a hidden way and the, the Bible says that the angel of the Lord appeared to him in Judges chapter 6 and as you can imagine Gideon is, is trying to hide yet this angel appears and in verse uh, 12, the, the angel of the Lord says, Mighty hero, the Lord is with you. And here is Gideon's reply. If the Lord is with us, why has all this happened to us? Meaning all of the battles against the enemies they had lost and all of the enemies were gaining possession and control over the, the Israelites. He continues to say, and where are all the miracles our ancestors told us about? Didn't they say the Lord brought us up out of Egypt? But now the Lord has abandoned us and handed us over to the Midianites. And then verse 14 says, Then the Lord turned to him and said, Go with the strength you have and rescue Israel from the Midianites. I am sending you. He didn't even acknowledge Gideon's claim. He didn't acknowledge Gideon's uh, sense of worth that was very low or self-esteem. He just said, Go, I'm, I'm calling you. Just, just step out in faith. Gideon says in verse 15, I, I love this story. He says, But Lord, Gideon replied, How can I rescue Israel? My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh, and I am the least in my entire family. Here, here, here it is. So Gideon was believing that what his ancestors had seen God do was true, was real, was part of their history, was part of their faith uh, being built in them as a nation. And yet when it comes time to see his reality in the circumstance he finds himself right then and there, the, the angel of the Lord appears to him and Gideon is like, what, what do you mean? What do you mean that I'm a mighty warrior? What do you mean that I'm going to be called out to save the people of Israel? When Look, look at the circumstance. Look, look, what, look what we're dealing with. I'm over here hiding because I'm scared that they're going to keep gaining on us. So fear was crippling Gideon. And so what does God do? God says, I'm going gonna, I'm, I'm gonna to let you know that I'm calling you in spite of yourself, in spite of your false belief. See, Gideon was believing that even though that was true for his ancestors and that was true historically that had happened, he couldn't believe that for himself. And so he lived his life based on a false belief. He lived his life based on the fact that he thought he was the weakest, the, the, the least of his tribe, of his clan, of his family, and that the tribe itself was the weakest, was the smallest, was the most insignificant. And how many times do we live our lives acting as if everything's fine, everything is well put together, but when it comes to the nitty gritty, we dig deep into our own false belief. Meaning, we have an opportunity to do something great for God because God is calling us to do it, God is empowering us to do it, but we we shrink back and we don't do it. We don't take the step. How many times do we struggle with fear? How many times do we struggle with insecurities, with self-pity, self-loathing, self-insufficiency, and, and we think that we don't have what it takes. We don't have what it takes to have a good marriage. We don't have what it takes to be good fathers. We don't have what it takes to be good husbands, good sons, good mentors to other men because we don't know the Bible that well, or we were never pastors, or we never had leadership roles. And we put all of these things and we keep putting ourselves away, but we act like we're good men. We act like we got it all together. We work hard. We work overtime. We provide. We, we make mad money for our family so that our family feels secured. And we uh, relegate ourselves in what we do instead of who we are. And we do these things based out of false beliefs because we think that that is where our worth and our value is. See, for me, a false belief began when I was in high school and I thought I was gonna play football in college and I thought I was gonna be professional and, 
And when a recruiter came into my home to speak to my parents, my mom was home and she uh, began to, you know, hear him out and see what the potential and options were. And my dad walks in to the house. This is about four o'clock in the afternoon. He's drunk out of his mind. And he sees this man in our living room speaking to my mom and myself. And in his drunk and, and, and out of kind of his, his uh, awareness, he goes, oh, who's this? What? And my mom tries to calm him down and say, it's okay. He's um, here because our son may be able to p- play football and go to school for free. And what came out of his mouth after that were not words. What came out of his mouth that hurt me deeply was this noise. And it went something like this. It's a gesture. It, it, it was a whole body sound. I mean, it was a combo. My dad goes, ah. In other words, yeah, right. So I didn't realize at the time the damage that it had done to my spirit. And it developed in me this fear of rejection. And the fear of rejection developed in me a performer. And so I would perform my way out of things and into things in order to avoid rejection. You see how that works? And that framed my belief system. It built it. It became the framework of anything that I would experience to filter through my belief system. That was the framework. And so you see how eventually that belief system came crashing down because of my behavior that got me in trouble. God is asking us, what is your belief system? Because if you dig deep and you start to really see where your belief system is, you're going to notice there's some false beliefs there. I'm not good enough. I'm never going to amount to anything. I always fail at what I do. I always start things and I never finish. I mean, there's so many. I actually, I I wrote a book, book about it. False beliefs that won't let me breathe. And you know why I titled that? because I would talk to myself and my self-talk was destructive. I would talk to myself and I would tell myself and I would convince myself of these things and that fed into my belief system, into my core beliefs. It developed my belief system, my core beliefs, and I would live my life this way. And then I had to realize that false beliefs are things that can choke the life out of us. You see, when you look up the word or the definition of of uh, breathing or oxygen or breath. It is this odorless uh, thing, this odorless gas that gives you life-giving substance. False belief is this odorless thing that is a life-sucking stronghold. And the Bible says that we are to devour or to bring down every stronghold that rises up against the knowledge of Jesus Christ. Our false beliefs are not based on biblical principles. Our false beliefs are based on feelings and things that we think about that have no biblical content. And so we must identify them, number one. We must devour them, take them down, and we must replace them with absolute truth. And the only absolute truth there is It's not a thing, it's a person, and that person is Jesus Christ. The Bible says that He is the way, the truth, and the life. He is the Word. He is the verb. He is the truth. And when we look to Him and we go to Him with our lives, we will find absolute truth. And all of our false beliefs must surrender to the absolute truth in the person of Jesus Christ. That is my challenge for you today. Who are you really? Are you Clark Kent or are you Superman? 
are you being who you want people to think you should be? Or are you being true to who you are, understanding that although you may have flaws, you may have things that we're working on, we're all working on, but you are under construction and you're in the process of being made whole and being made into the image of God's Son, Jesus Christ. God bless you, and remember, devour, destroy, take down every false belief, and replace it with absolute truth.